the lecture series. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Schwartz. Um, he's going to be giving our talk today. And uh, a little bit of background information about Dr. Schwartz. Um, he went to Swarthmore College for undergrad, um, where he said he studied everything, literally everything. Um, he then got his PhD at Cornell. Uh, he has worked previously at the New School for Social Research. Um, he currently uh, works at UVA. Um, and he said he's also taught at, at a variety of other places because he gets bored very easily. <laughs> um, Dr. Schwartz has uh, authored seven books. Uh, most recently, the uh, it's called Subprime Nation, American Power, Global Capital, and the Housing Bubble. Uh, he was a Fulbright Scholar. Uh, he's currently working on three projects. Uh, one is uh, co-authoring a book called Babies, Bonds, and Buildings, and um, we'll be looking at uh, effectively the question, why can't millennials move out of their parents' basement? Which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, another interesting fact, um, he was raised in, uh, in China in the Shaolin Monastery until about 18, before he went to college, which I thought was a joke until 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, so, without further ado. I think you should wait until uh, until I'm done, because it might be terrible talk. Also, I should say, I wrote three books, and I co-edited four. That's where the second comes from. But since this has been taped, and um, my co-editors might see it and feel bad, I have to correct that. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to I'm talking about something you guys maybe some of the more distinguished faculty here might remember um, why this is funny. But for those of you who live in the Spotify world, um, we're already past this. But this is one of the things I'm talking about. And I'm also going to talk about this, which you may remember from a couple months ago, which is uh, why is it that Mylan can charge $600 for an adrenaline injector when adrenaline is um, in the public domain? And when it was the Defense Department that actually developed the device um, contract, as it always does, by contracting with um, a research institute, um, what is it that makes it possible for Milan to charge 600 bucks? And I'm also going to connect that to a little bit to um, the European concern, which is how come it can, how come um, we have, um, how come we have uh, the EU. Um, trying to squeeze $14.5 billion um, out of Apple. Why is it that Apple actually has $14.5 billion that could be taken away, <laughs> sitting in a file cabinet in, a very big file cabinet, because yeah, it's billions of dollars, in, in Ireland. Um, so I'm going to connect all those things. And basically, the idea here is to explain why we have slow growth and rising in inequality in the modern economy, both in the US and in Europe, um, and in Asia to a certain extent. And before I get started, I have to do two throat clearing exercises. One is to give you a sense of numbers, because I'm going to put out some numbers. And people are, find it very hard to grasp big numbers. Like if I say a trillion dollars, it's hard to imagine what a trillion dollars is. Right? If I say, um, and this is another number that's hard to understand. If I say um, $30 billion, it's hard to understand what that looks like. But when I talk at UVA, I say $30 billion is the local economy. Right? And then people have a sense of what that means. But I, I want to give you this, a sense of what the numbers are. And then I'm going to um, just do a real quick thing about basic economics. So here's the numbers. Here's the numbers. Um, this is the Obama stimulus in response to the worst financial crisis in US history that anyone can remember, except for me, because I was born back in the early 19th century. Um, and it was $831 billion stimulus over three years. So this is almost a trillion dollars of stimulus, OK? It's, as these people would say, it's a lot of money, right? Um, now, here's Apple's cash holdings in 2014 scaled against that stimulus. Those cash holdings have gone up. Um, back then, it was a, about $185, $187 billion. Now, it's closer to $215 billion. That's despite Apple giving an extraordinary dividend a couple of years ago um, to get rid of some of that cash. One company. Here's, excuse me, one second, because um, I keep getting this uh, edge room thing kicking in, and it's distracting. OK. So um, Apple, 
And here's the top 15 U.S. firms ranked only by their offshore holdings, not their total holdings. Uh, 2014, it's a bit more than the stimulus. So this is money that's basically sitting idle. So if you know your canes, this is the liquidity trap. And for those of you um, who are taking pictures of the slides, I've copywritten this and I'm gonna sue you. No, you just send me an email, I'll send you the slides, and I'm, um, I give the slides usually to Tam anyway. And when you look at this list, there's one company that stands out on this list as Sesame Street would have it. Uh, one of these things is not like the others. And it's this company. And what makes this company different from all the others is that it actually deals in physical stuff. And those of you who can read will say immediately, but wait, what, what about them? They do, they do stuff, right? And the answer is no, they don't. Not anymore. And I'm going to talk about that not anymore bit. That's firm structures. What characterizes most of these firms is that they all have the same strategy. The strategy is to create monopoly or near monopoly through the use of intellectual property rights, which allow you to sue potential competitors out of the market. And they've matched that to a change in their industrial structure, which concentrates profits into a small number of firms that have these robust intellectual property rights. Uh, and unfortunately for the economy, what this means is high levels of income inequality and low levels of investment. And this is not just a U.S. program, uh, it's just program. This is not just a U.S. problem, but if we expand to the rest of U.S. Uh, firms, here's all U.S. non-financials, um, a bit more than twice as much cash sitting around. It's not just a U.S. problem, it's something that's been going on in other countries to a lesser extent because many of those economies have fewer firms that are able to pursue this strategy. But nonetheless, what we see is lots and lots of cash sitting idle. So here's global cash holdings 2014 for the 1,200 largest firms in the world, non-financial firms. And it's um, roughly four times the size of the Obama stimulus. So we can imagine even if they spent a fourth of this, right, you'd have an economic um, stimulus that would be quite considerable. And the way to see how this plays out is to do some simple GDP accounting. So here's how economists understand GDP. It's an accounting convention. C plus G plus I plus net exports is GDP. Consumption, government spending, that isn't just transfer spending, which comes into C. Government spending on infrastructure, R&D, et cetera. I, investment, and net exports. And so if we're concerned with growth, which is what we're concerned with, right? It's the deltas that matter. Delta consumption, delta government, delta investment give you the delta in GDP, okay? So why do we have slow growth? Well, the usual arguments say, okay, right, it's about consumption. The usual arguments say we've had rising income inequality in the US. This is the problem of the 1%. They get all the money and you get all the debt, okay? And the thing about the rich is um, whatever other nice features they may have, they have a low marginal propensity to consume. Rich people spend less money out of the top total pile of money that comes their way. And the way you can understand this is, if you have a billion dollars sitting in your pocket, yeah, somewhere, um, and you get a 5% rate of return on that, which is lower than the historic real rate of return, and for some reason you don't want your pile of cash to increase. Okay, you have a billion dollars, you're happy with a billion dollars and you're getting 5% rate of return, you would have to spend every day of your life, for the rest of your life, $137,000 a day to keep the pile of cash from growing. Okay. It's, it's hard to do that. I've tried, <laughs> but it's hard. Okay. So the rich spend less. So the usual arguments are rising income inequality lead to less growth in consumption and therefore less aggregate demand in the economy, and therefore less growth. And the problem with that explanation is not that it's wrong. It's actually right, but it's quite evidently incomplete. Most of the people who make this argument, they somehow forgot this from Econ 101 or whatever it was that we learned it. They forgot that. And they also asked the question about where the income inequality comes from. And that's a puzzle to me. Both of these things are actually a puzzle to me. It's a puzzle to me because Money doesn't just fall out of the sky, unless you're lucky. Um, 
And so the incomes have to come from somewhere, and the somewhere that income is coming from is from firms. So finally we get to what I have to say. So here's my argument, for those of you who know Monty Python, my argument, here's my argument. Um, the argument is that intellectual property rights, firm strategy, plus firm structure, corporate structure, creates inequality among <laughs> firms, and this drives all the other things. Inequality among firms drives the kind of wages that firms pay, and you know this in your gut, right? You all want a good job, and a good job is working for Google, not working for hospitality services. Okay? You'd rather be a mid-level administrator at Google than a mid-level administrator at hospitality services. Um, so firms are the ones that form incomes. They're driving income inequality, but firms also drive the delta and G. Obviously politically, because they lobby against, sometimes, government spending, but less obviously, all that money, the three and a half trillion dollars you saw a few slides ago, that's sitting in global tax havens, it can't be taxed. So governments do face an actual problem of getting revenues to increase spending. It's not just the politics. They can't get their hands on the money. That's what the EU suing Apple and Ireland is all about. That's what that fourteen and a half billion dollars is. And then it's firms that do investment, and I'll explain as I go on, but the short version here is the firms that have the money don't invest, the firms that need to invest don't get the money. And by the money, I mean the profits. And then as for this, we can talk a bit about this, but I think it's less important because globally, by definition, this nets out, although it has effects. So that's the, that's the argument, and that's what I just, that's what this is, this is the argument. The argument is firms' strategies are to use intellectual property rights to create semi-permanent monopolies, it gives you profit inequality, low real investment, slow growth, that's the investment side, and then um, the change in the global division of labor, and also the domestic division of labor, changes in firm structure, industrial organization, gives you this global wedding cake economy, is the phrase I like, wage inequality, secular stagnation. That's the argument. So let me take a second here to let you look at that. I'll take a drink. This is vodka, right? Mm, okay, good. Will mm -hmm. make me more lucid? Let's try it. <laughs> okay, so we start here at the end. Like all good movies, we start at the end. And then we'll get back to the end at the end. So we have slow growth. And um, you can um, believe me or you can believe what you see. Um, but here you have uh, average rate of GDP growth, weighted, okay, because it Luxembourg growing at 5% a year doesn't help very much in the global economy. Um, weighted in the 1980s, the G7, the other rich countries, 1990s. The Euro zone is not separated out from these countries. It's still in these numbers here, but separated out so you can see that the Euro zone actually even worse. So growth has slowed down. And here's the usual suspect, right? People have been saying the wage share of GDP has been falling continuously since its peak in the early 70s, at the end of the great wave of strikes that start in the mid-1960s. So different patterns, slightly different patterns in different countries, different starting points, but generally what you see is this drop. The dotted line is all the rich OECD countries, um, but in this case, unweighted, unfortunately, because I'm extremely lazy. Um, and I've smoothed it out with a three-year average. And you can see basically from here to here, the wage share of GDP has fallen about five percentage points. And where did that money go? Well, it went to the rich people. And you've probably seen this chart, which is um, put out by Economic Policy Institute, updated periodically. I stole the data and recomposed it to make a prettier chart. Um, if you index productivity and um, average wage uh, at, at 100, in this case it's percentages, but at 100 in 1948, they grow together until the 70s. And what this means macroeconomically is supply and demand are growing together, the economy's balanced. And then we get all the problems that we see today, starting in the 70s, wages are stagnant, productivity goes up, growth slows down, there's too much supply, okay? And it's not just a US story, it's pretty much everywhere. And what looks like an interesting exception, which is Germany, but right, it seems to be more or less moving together. But that's because this graph just gives you real manufacturing wages. 
um, when you look at the entire German economy, what you see is basically the same pattern. Wages are stagnant, productivity goes up. <coughs> Too much supply, not enough demand. What's the difference? between this and the one before. This is all German workers, not just manufacturing workers. So this is the per so person making your cappuccino, and service and services. Yeah. Knowledge economy? Yeah, they have some knowledge economy, too. I'm told. Oh, okay. I'm told. I visit the universities. It's hard to believe, but no. They do have some more people there. Not, a, not, not a, but you know, the effect in Germany of knowledge economy is much smaller. And I'll talk about differences among countries in a few minutes. OK. So if you go back to the US, right, um, the effect of that widening gap between productivity and between output and wages can be seen in the distribution of, of income. And so here's the top 1%, right, getting um, most of the benefits of growth uh, over the last uh, 40 years. And as I say, that presents them with a problem, right? They have too much money to spend. And in the normal course of things, right, it shouldn't matter because, okay, I have money, I can't spend it all, I can't spend that whole $137,000 a day, so I'm gonna save some of it. And we know, by definition, S has to equal I. So how come savings are not translated into investment? And this is a great puzzle for people because people have forgotten stuff that we knew 80 years ago. Keynes asked exactly this question. He said, savings should equal investment. Why don't we get investment? And the answer is, savings by definition equals investment, but savings can equal investment at a high level or at a low level. And if there's too much saving and not enough investment, you will get an equilibration of those two things in which savings declines to match investment because income is declining because growth is slow. And the essence of Keynes is that there are multiple states of the world, but we can think about two polar opposites, low wage, low profit, low investment, low growth, and a high wage, high profit, high investment, high growth world. And savings will equal investment in all of those cases. So we can ask the question, why doesn't this, that's all that, a lot of money there, right? Why doesn't it get turned into investment? It should, but it, it doesn't. Here's investment trends. <coughs> gross domestic investment as a percentage of GDP. Again, smooth, somewhat different presentation of countries. Um, and again, the dotted line is, is uh, the G7. And again, somewhat different, some variation uh, among countries and groups, but the same basic trend, right? It's down, investment falls. Um, if we <coughs> just pick one bad actor, okay, Germany, currently running an 8% of GDP current account surplus. Why is that? It's because they don't spend any money. They don't spend anything on investment. Here's German investment as a percentage of GDP, lower than the G7 average. They're under-investing, they're under-consuming. So firms produce a lot of stuff, they sell it, it doesn't get recycled into investment, where does it go? It gets turned into cash. So here's cash holdings for US firms. Non-utility, non-financial. Financial firms always hold a lot of cash. Utilities, um, by convention, are taken out of the picture because they're regulated for the most part. And what you see is rising cash holdings in terms of dollars. And of course, the question that immediately should come to your minds is, oh yeah, okay, but I mean, the economy is also growing. So did this just grow in proportion with the economy and with uh, firms' asset holdings in general? And the answer is no, it grew faster. Firms' cash holdings as a share of their assets went from about 5% in 1990 to about 12% uh, uh, in 2010. Okay? okay, so firms are holding more cash. Which firms? This is why this is an IPR story. When you look at firms' profitability over the, lot, the 10 years uh, for which it, there's data you can actually use easily, um, what you see is there's a huge amount of inequality among firms. Um, now, shed a tear. Um, we care about inequality among people because people are you know, important. We're here because we care about people. It's not obvious we should care about firms. We should, should we care about these firms that don't make profits? I mean, who cares, right? 
It has consequences, though. So that's why we have to shed a tear. So there's huge inequality of profitability among firms. Um, this Gini index is calculated by adding up um, the profits of the 2,000 largest firms in the world, the Forbes Global 2000, over the 10-year period uh, 06 to 15. Um, catch me in a few months, I'll update it to get the 2016 data, which actually refers to 2015, all of this is a year back. And the Gini index is 0.65, I'll just leave one, I'll round it up, which is like South Africa. You guys know South Africa? It's a pretty, pretty unequal society. If you saw the movie District 9, it's not really fiction, right? Um, Brazil, if you know Brazil, this actually, this number is better than it's been, but still a pretty unequal society. And then we, of course, know what Europe looks like here in TAM. Okay. So it's a lot of inequality. So why, 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 right? We know there's not enough investment. We know there's cash sitting around. We know the cash is unequally, dis unequally distributed. The cash from, comes from profits. Why? Well, question? Yeah. Um, if Sweden is down there at 0.24, and I suppose Holland, Norway are about similar, then that might arguably an optimal degree of inequality. So if you had something at 10%, they're probably not that small. They might be too small to notice, but they're probably not that productive. Do you have any um, this, is house, this is households, not firms. Yeah. Is that, okay. So I, I don't, I, I don't even, I don't care to answer the question actually, because I only give you these numbers to show that relative to what we think of as a relatively equal society, this is really unequal. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, how how do we understand what's going on? Well, how do we understand this inequality of profits? This is about firm strategies. So now in this picture we're here. Okay. And to understand that we have to understand intellectual property rights. So here's Eleanor Ostrom. One of the really smart people in the world. Um, she um, basically, and her husband, and Russell Harden, but she gave us a way to think about goods. Okay. And she <coughs> asked the question, okay, she says, goods have two different kinds of characteristics, excludable access or not excludable <coughs> access, and rivalrousness of consumption, or she liked to, to say subtractability. So we understand private goods. This is a private good. It's excludable. It's in my hands now. You'll have to pry it out of my cold, dead fingers to get it. And its consumption is rival. I drink, there's less there for you to use, okay? And we also understand public goods, right? It's the air around us. I can't stop you from breathing um, unless I suck all the oxygen out of the room in this boring talk. Um, and uh, consumption is non-rival, right? So what about these other things? Common pool goods you know, fish in the ocean. Rivalrous consumption means I can take them out, but there's no excludability if we're in the open ocean. This is the tricky one that people don't think about too much. Economists call it a club good or a total good. I like to call it a franchise good because a franchise <coughs> is a government-granted monopoly. And <coughs> this good has interesting characteristics. It is excludable. They are excludable, but not by their nature. They're excludable because someone writes a property right around them, and they're non-rival. So Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is a club good or a franchise good. We can, within certain limits, we can all use the Wi-Fi. It's not rivalrous in its consumption. But it is potentially excludable. If you don't have the login code, you're not getting it. Make sense? OK. The modern economy is built on turning pure public goods into property. The modern economy, IPRs, intellectual property rights, is about taking ideas, which in principle are non-rival, non-excludable, therefore free, except nobody wants them to be free, because you can't make money if something's free. You have to turn it into property. Uh, this is where the age gap shows. OK, so I have an MP3 file I want to share with my friends. I ripped it off my CD, remember CDs? I don't know about the Spotify thing, I'm too old. I want to share it with my friends. It's protected by digital rights management software. I can make five copies of my iTunes thing. I can put them on my <coughs> devices. I want to share this great song with you. You've got to come and listen with the one ear bud while I'm listening to the other ear bud. Very awkward. I can't give it to you. I have a file on my Kindle, which I don't have here to use as a prop. I can't share it with you. Okay. I have a formula for a new drug. You can't have that formula because I've 
patented. I write some great code, unless it's Linux. I've copywritten it. You can't have it. I think of ridiculous things like slide to unlock. You try to use it, I sue your butt for in excess of a billion dollars, which is what Apple did to Samsung. Why? To keep them out of the market. It deters entry into the market. Copyright, patent, trademark, brand, they deter entry into the market. They prevent market entry. They give you a monopoly. Put aside the question of whether this actually spurs innovation or not. It's an open question. We can discuss it in Q&A. The practical effects today are that it creates these monopolies. And we know that this really matters because the arbiter of all that is good and real in society tells us that it's important. And that's the stock market. This is the market capitalization percent, okay? Market capitalization of the S&P 500 in the US and the, divided into tangible assets, factories, machines, and intangible assets, IPRs. 1975, 80% of the market cap, that's the automobile economy. 1975, 80% of the market cap of the S&P is tangible assets. 2015, 83% of market cap is intangibles. So we know this must be true. The market says, oh, you've got a monopoly. That means big profits. That means your share should be some multiple of that potential profit stream in the future. Your market cap gets bigger. All right? And the consequence of that is this inequality among firms, which here is their market cap at the end of 2014. Again, the Forbes Global 2000. Here's their market cap, and it's a power curve. The top 100 firms are most of the market cap uh, of the world. The tail is long and small. And here's where you see the ability not just to have a monopoly, but to protect the monopoly. I'm Google. My business is built on ads. Someone comes along that has software that threatens that monopoly. Maybe it's better a better algorithm for parsing ads. I'm Google and I'm using mapping software to connect ads to locations, to target ads to people. Someone comes along with better mapping software. What's my response? Ah, oh, I've got a huge market capitalization, and I've got a big pile of cash. I'll just buy them up. We'll make people an offer they can't refuse. And so Google does stuff that makes no sense in the world unless you think of this as being a strategy in which you defend a monopoly using patents and the threat of lawsuit. So Motorola, here's a Motorola. It's actually made by a company called Lenovo. It's a Chinese company. They bought this little M that's on the back of the phone from Google. Google, in turn, got the M by buying Motorola Mobility back uh, uh, in 2012, I think it was, um, 2011. Um, bought Motorola, Motorola Mobility at a time when Motorola had 0.5% of the global market share for cell phones. And they paid $12.5 billion for that. Why would you pay 12 and a half? That's a lot of money, even for me. Why would you pay $12.5 billion for a company with half a percent of market share that was losing market share? And all it really had was two bits of street cred. One was great batteries, still true. And the other was, again, for those of us of a certain age, oh yeah, they invented that Star Trek-like communicator flip phone, which was like a huge, like, wow, I can't believe I have this. But by 2011, eh, you know, the market is you guys. You're, you don't remember that. Why buy it? Well, they're not shy about telling you why. In business language, right? Page says, our acquisition of Motorola increases competition by strengthening Google's patent portfolio which will enable us to better protect Android from anti-competitive threats from Microsoft, Apple, and other companies. And what he meant by that was, they have patents and they can threaten to sue us. Oh, but we just bought all of Motorola's patents. So if Apple sues us because we're trying to push Android into the cell phone market as an OS, well, we'll sue those people right back. So don't mess with us, because we've got nuclear weapons too. So that's the strategy. You preempt your rivals, you buy up the software. Here's the list of Google's acquisitions. Motorola Mobility, I mean, this is just partial, but big money, right? Motorola Mobility, <coughs> Nest, data from houses, 
double click ads, YouTube, ad delivery device, Waze mapping software, actually very good GPS system for those of you who don't know, ad mode, et cetera. Okay? A lot of stuff, a lot of ad companies. They just buy them up. Okay? And then once you buy them, you can sue people. So here's the ecology of lawsuits over patents for um, smartphones in 2011, 2012. We really care about them. Yeah. Yeah. And wherever there's a double line, it suits against each other, right? So, um, and these things, again, I mean, what are they over? Google sues Samsung for a couple billion dollars over slide to unlock, tap a phone number to call, um, something to do with pictures, which I forget, right? And these are, these are trivial things. And this lawsuit's still going on, and app, as it stands now, <coughs> Apple stands to get in excess of $200 uh, million dollars, um, over this. But slide to unlock, not really, doesn't strike me as something that's intrinsically patentable. Um, and in fact, the Supreme Court has said, in effect, it shouldn't be patented. But here's, here's how things stand. So this is the U.S. Congressional Research Service. Barriers to entry. Okay, from patents. And in the pharmaceutical industry, right, 40%, what does that mean? What it means is this. This is the Mylon EpiPen story. Average rate of increase of the price of branded pharmaceuticals, <coughs> 2006 to 2013, this is a point in time in which inflation in the U.S. economy, at best, 2%, some years 1%. Over this same eight-year time period, prices of pharmaceuticals in the EU and prices of pharmaceuticals in Britain will rise by approximately 9% over the whole period, not 9% like this one year. Okay, And that's partly because Patents give you a monopoly, right? But we're still in a world in which there's bargaining. If you have a state that says, all very well and good that you have this patent, but we're not paying that price, and we're 2% of the world market, 3% of the world market, right? We're the Australian state. We're the national health system of Britain. When you're not paying that price, you can bargain the price down. Okay? But here, we don't do that. So, we pay more. Okay? All right. So, summary. Firm strategy, create intellectual property rights, use them to create a monopoly. Monopolies give you big profit streams. Okay. And what happens to that money? We need to talk about firm structures and division of labor. And one way to understand what we're talking about here and what goes on here is what Wall Street cares about is not, not just profits, but a ratio, return on equity, return on assets. We talked about the R part so far big profits from IPRs, but what about the A part? What about the asset part? Because you can make this bigger, but if the asset part's getting bigger too, the ratio stays the same. What Wall Street wants to see is this gets bigger, this gets smaller, then the ratio gets bigger. And that's a story about global division of labor. So that's this bit, okay? So what we have is a new global division of labor, a different kind of firm structure, it's both global and domestic in the sense that we see the same thing happening at a global level as we see happening at a domestic level. Part of the differences across rich countries reflect their position in this division of labor. What is it they're doing? Okay. And the basic story here is the one that is one you already know. I mean, this story is out there. Um, you try and keep your core employees, coders, but not the ones that are not core employees, cleaners mid-level administrators, accounting, catering, get rid of them. And one reason to get rid of them is, if you do that, you don't have to share your monopoly profits with them. In the 1950s, 60s, into the 70s, we had oligopolistic structure in, for example, the automobile industry. They made oligopoly profits, but they had to share those profits with the workforce, and the workforce not only was unionized, but included the people who were doing IP type stuff, the people who were doing physical production, and all the other ancillary support staff. So rents were redistributed. Here the rents are concentrated into a smaller handful of employees. Same thing with physical capital. You own physical <laughs> capital, it depreciates, the market might be stagnant, and you're stuck with this big investment in stuff that raises the A in return on assets. You shove that out of the company too. Let someone else take the risk of building things. 
We'll design them. We'll extract maximum value from the commodity chain by controlling the intellectual property. You get the risk of having the excess employees. You get the risk of having the excess physical equipment. And we take our profits and park them in the tax havens, which is the government story, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but again, I'll take questions. So what that gives you is this kind of structure, a wedding cake, right? It's a wedding cake in terms of where the people are. At the top, you have firms that are, in the ideal case, pure intellectual property plays. Human capital heavy, labor and physical capital light. So uh, iconically, Apple. But it's also Hilton. They're a brand owner. They don't actually own buildings. They don't actually run their own hotels. You walk into a Hilton hotel, or you walk into, as I did recently, you walk into a Marriott, big smile, hi, Mr. Schwartz, you're one of our gold card holders. That's wonderful. You get free Wi-Fi, free breakfast. Is there anything we need to make your stay pleasant? And they're in a Marriott uniform, Marriott in their name. And you might think, oh, this is a Marriott employee. And you might think, well, you walk under the big Marriott sign into the hotel. Oh, this is a Marriott building. But it's not. It's Marriott branded. The employee is from Hospitality Services Corporation, or ADECO. They contract labor into the hotel industry. The building's owned by a real estate investment trust. Professors, TIAA, that's you. You own that building. Okay. Or a real estate investment trust owns it. So you have that wedding cake. Brand, physical capital, labor intensive production. Um, high wages, medium wages, low wages. High profits. Low profits in terms of profit per employee, okay? And in the middle, some barriers to entry because physical capital, big investments, this is something people don't just lightly do. If you're in the semiconductor industry, you don't build a $2 billion fabrication facility just because you feel like it, right? So there's a barrier to entry there. So they still make some money. Oops. Car industry, same thing. Um, we're not going to have time to really go through this. Question? Yes. Um, you said that there are barriers to entry in the, in the second tier. Yes. Uh, but wouldn't arguably barriers to entry would also be like lawsuits and monopolies on the, on, on the first tier, right? Yeah. They have the best barrier to entry because you can stop somebody cold, right? Yeah. Here the barrier to entry is, okay, global car market has 10, 15% over capacity. I want to enter the market with a, a new vehicle. Do I really want to build a new factory to do that? Wow. That's a, again, a billion bucks, two billion bucks. It's expensive. I think twice about doing that. And as I was saying um, uh, at, uh, before uh, coming in here, if you're in a world in which demand is growing 2 or 3% a year and you can get 2 or 3% productivity gains from your existing physical capital per year, which is pretty typical, why would you invest in new capital except to replace stuff you've worn out? Okay. So here's the iPhone 5, three generations ago. But I'm a lazy person. No, we don't have num we don't have the numbers to put into this bit for uh, for the phone yet for the companies because the data only go up to 2014. Um, but you know you can look down these columns. The important one is this one. Since we don't have too much time, profit as a percentage of sales for Qualcomm. Every cell phone in the world uses Qualcomm software. Okay. For Qualcomm, actually 30% is percentage of sales. They don't have that many employees. Apple, more, 20%. Here's two physical capital heavy firms, STM, a European firm. They make microprocessors, Samsung, which if you don't know, makes the processor for the uh, Apple iPhones. Maybe not in the next round. Um, Right, and then here's Hong High Precision, Foxconn. They have a million employees in China. They're a Taiwanese firm. They put everything together. Low wage labor. Okay. Let's think a little bit about what this world looks like. We use Europe and the U.S., and we'll contrast Microsoft, which is by nobody's calculation a best-in-class firm. Okay, but they have a ton of patents and a ton of prior acquisitions. I could show you a slide, I, but I don't, because it's impossible to read. It's the equivalent of that Google slide with the list of things they bought. 
I'll send it to you if you want it. But it's impossible to read. It's so dense because they've acquired so many firms over the years. But Microsoft, not a best-in-class firm. And Lubar, number of employees, 100,000 employees. Average between 2010 and 2014. Profits, uh, almost half a trillion dollars. Sorry, almost $100 billion, right, red, red outside. Okay. So if you make the ratio here, lots of profits per employee. Now here's a bunch of companies that make things. Physical capital intense, barriers to entry. You know these firms. Best in class, best in class, best in deception. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> okay. Audi has fewer employees than Microsoft, but the rest of them have more. Look at the profits. When you add them up, right, we're talking about, okay, cumulatively, these German firms, which have some protection, either because they're good, whatever that means in the car industry, or because um, uh, they have this, uh, you know, nobody wants to create too much capacity in autos, right? They have um, profits that are uh, about 80% higher in the aggregate than Microsoft. But to do that, they need 10 times as many employees. And the physical capital footprint for these firms compared to Microsoft, huge. My kid interviewed at Microsoft. My kid interviewed at Microsoft. I said, what did you see? She said, what I, what, what I always see in, in, in all these uh, uh, places, a lot of employees uh, coding and playing ping pong and talking and group meetings. I said, do you see any machines? And she was like, what do you mean machines? I said, did you see any people doing dirty work? She said, well, there were people in the cafeteria. But again, that's the same story, right? So whereas we know what these factories look like, they're highly automated, but there's still a lot of people and a lot of machinery. It's a factory. Okay. So this is the new economy, right? These people are at the top of the wedding cake. These people who are making a product in which about, depending on the car, 60 to 70 percent of the value of the car is the software and electronics. Okay. Typical car now has the equivalent of this in the car, operating the car. Think about all those things. The telematics, the entertainment, the engine uh, uh, computer, the anti-lock brakes, the tire pressure sensors. Right? All of this is electronics. All of it, it has code. Where's the code coming from? Specialized firms. Where are the chips coming from? Specialized firms that do design. Okay. Many of these firms have quasi-monopolies. One second. Remember the tsunami in Japan? Okay. And Fukushima? In that area of Japan is a company called Renesas. They make chips. They make 50% of the chips in the world for engine computer modules. Okay? So they shut down for a week because of the tsunami. And there was chaos in the car industry. It's like everybody's like, how many pieces do we have in inventory? Can we wait this out? Okay? That's the value in the car. It's not the machines that put the car together anymore. Okay? So that's why you get this. Um. With Google Cars, so the self-driving industry, how would that affect this trend, you think? I, mean, um, I don't think, uh, this, it, it is consistent with this trend. I don't think Google intends to be Tesla. They're not making a physical product. And I don't think Tesla intends to be Tesla. <laughs> Tesla intends to be, Tesla wants to be BMW. We make a few cars really high end. Oh, and by the way, we have the best battery technology in the world, and as the rest of you try and enter the electric age, as you all will, here, use our battery technology. Mm -hmm. And the model here is, you know, free hugs and premium hugs, $2 hugs. You can have the free hug from me, or you can get the premium hug. And Tesla is going to offer the premium hug, which is you use our software, you use our battery designs. You can have that technology, but you want to upgrade it, you want to update it, you want service. Right? You've got a problem, because this is actually the software is incredibly complicated. You're going to pay us. So what's, what Tesla would like to do is sell to every single one of these people. They want to be Qualcomm. 
in that sense, but Qualcomm that makes cars. Google, same thing. What Google is doing with self-driving cars, I don't think they want to build cars, but what they want is here's the software that enables this car to navigate. We have billions of data points. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, for driving around with Waze on all the time, right? Because now we know exactly where everything is, and we have this incredible statistical profile of traffic in Charlottesville, right? That's the essence of the, the model. They don't want, why would you want to have a factory? Even Tesla, right? They bought an existing factory cheap, they didn't build a new one. They might, and they're building the Gigafactory to make the batteries. But, you know, for the cars, not. Okay. So even when we look at Germany, you can see the effects of this wedding cakeization. If you're in the middle, you also don't want to get too many employees. And so if you look at German wages, what you see is this growing divergence. And what this is all about is people coming into the labor market with these crappy jobs courtesy of Hartz IV. Do you guys know Hartz IV? Who doesn't? Hands up. Okay. Germany has an unemployment problem. Um, the simplest possible explanation is to say from the 80s forward, <coughs> during a bad, during a vicious cycle. Um, uh, we want to take care of everybody, so we charge you, the employer, um, a tax to pay into the, uh, the social assistance funds. And um, that means, and and that tax is built into your cost of employment. So here's our worker who gets a net wage, and here's the cost to the employer. And um, from the employer's point of view, that means there's a gap between what they have to pay and what the employee thinks they should give in terms of work. And so the employer's like, OK, I want higher productivity from you, the employee. So I train you more, but I don't hire new people uh, at, the, at the margin. And what that means is more and more people become unemployed, which means higher and higher social insurance charges which means that gap gets bigger. So for those of you who work in America, you know, if you make $100 an hour, okay, if you make $10 an hour, it costs your employer $1.75, 7.5% social security tax, FICA. That's this wedge, right? The equivalent for Germany, and if you take the employer side and the employee side in the US, it's seven and a half times two, 15%. In Germany, the wedge is 40%. So the bad cycle is why hire somebody? I gotta pay them $140 an hour. They're getting $100. They're gonna give me $100 worth of work because they look at their paycheck and like, why am I working so hard? Human psychology. So you stop hiring people, but you get a vicious cycle. More and more people are unemployed because you're not hiring people. You're retraining your existing employees. Hearts reforms were designed to break that. What they said was supply side, demand side. If you're an employer, you don't have to pay those social contributions when you hire someone under Hearts 4. So you have to do more demand. And on the supply side, it was like, oh, you're on social assistance? Well, you have to get a job or we're going to take it away from you. So it pushed people into the labor market. And what that means is from 2002 to 2013, Germany's unemployment problem disappears. And if you read the Wall Street Journal, what they say is superior exports, Chinese demand, blah, blah, blah. No, because those companies are not hiring anybody. BW doesn't want to hire more people. They've got excess employees. It's seven and a half million mini jobs. People coming into the market for part-time jobs at 10 euro an hour. And this is now 20% of the labor force, which is why 15th percentile right, comes down. And acutely after 2002. And of those, okay, 62% are female. The gender division of labor in Germany reflected in the inequality of income. And 27% uh, are between the ages of 50 and 65, which is old people like me in these more and more complicated factories who can't figure out actually how to use this and are not retrainable and are gently eased out, as I would be, from the labor force into the cold, cool hearts for market. Okay. Um, another 12%, by the way, are over 65. All right, so here's the story you just heard. We have a problem of secular stagnation, slow growth in the world economy. It's usually explained by income inequality. That's correct. It's partial, though. And it doesn't explain where income inequality comes from. The problem we have, to a large extent in the world economy, is that firms have changed their strategy and structure from what we saw in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. 
and that change in strategy and structure is a change from a is a change to a strategy of using intellectual property rights to create monopoly positions in the market. The change in structure is to expel as much labor and capital, physical capital, as possible. And so you end up with firms that have lots and lots of money, but no need to invest. They pay their workers really well. Their investment strategy is to pay their workers even more. Get the best coders to design the best database. My child who interviewed at Microsoft is a beneficiary of this. She's at the top of the wedding cake. Okay? She's paid an incredible amount of money to make databases work. But that's not investment the way we understood it in the old days. What happens is her salary <coughs> lands in her hand. And what does she do? She chases real estate in Boston. So we don't get investment from that concentration of profits. We get investment in a different way, hiring people to do this coding, but not investment with strong multiplier effects. Instead, it just causes a bidding up of positional goods. There's only so many houses in Somerville. There's only so many houses in Silicon Valley. There's more houses here. <laughs> so you will see some relocation here. But we don't get investment. Companies that actually do physical investment, they're totally rational. They look at this and say, well, we have some surplus capacity or we're more or less at capacity, but we know we're smart, we can get 2-3% productivity growth per year. Why build a new factory, which really is a net new addition to capacity? We don't have the money. We'd have to borrow money to do it. We risk driving down our profits by creating over capacity, and so we're not going to invest. And at the bottom, you have lots of people with no money, but lots of debt, right? Because the counterpart to lots and lots of cash holdings and assets over here, financial assets, by definition means a lot of debt over here one way or the other. And so they can't spend either. So consumption is constrained, investment's constrained. And I didn't talk too much about it, but it should be obvious from $3.5 trillion sitting in tax havens, government spending is constrained. And that means that growth is slower. Questions? Okay, I've got um, yes. pink shirt in the back and then Mr. Vest. So I'm from India and um, I've grown up in the U.S. so I'm kind of a global citizen if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this going, so it looks like a lot of the intellectual property rights in the top of the wedding cake is in the western <coughs> world. 